Scribbles has issues. But we knew that going in, right? We bought this car a couple of weeks ago. The issues appeared to be obvious to us, but the ones that we're dealing with right now, they were totally unexpected. And this is common, this is typical. No revival project ever goes in a completely straight line. You don't go from barely running basket case to fully functional daily driver in one clean shot. There's always the ups and the downs. You take one step forward, you take two steps backwards. That's common, it's, it's to be expected. And then sometimes you take a step forward and you have to take five steps backwards. And that's where we're at right now. And what we're doing, what we're having to deal with, is we're unraveling issues that were bestowed on the car by previous people who've worked on it. This is very common. These cars, you know, this one, it's a 60 year old car. God only knows how many hands have been on it. How many times it was just, you know, hammered together to just get down the road. People who aren't really familiar with these cars, who don't really pay attention to the details, will do a lot of stuff that in the long run will bite you. And like I said, that's what we're up against. So to bring you up to speed, we bought the car, brought it back here. We figured, well, the first thing, let's give it a tune up and get everything running up to snuff. So we changed the plugs, the cap, the rotor, um, the wires, set the, the timing, adjusted the carburetor, drove the car. But we still had a bit of a drivability issue. It didn't want to take gas. It was running like a cold engine that had the choke all the way open. So we determined that the exhaust crossover under the carburetor on this intake manifold was clogged, which is a very common thing. We did a whole video on that. The exhaust crossover on this is essential for the car to run properly because these carburetors are calibrated lean, they're calibrated for drivability. So they need some of that exhaust heat to vaporize some of the fuel that gets, that's come through the carburetor, comes through atomized and it comes through cold, and it needs that exhaust manifold heat to lighten some of it up, vaporize some of it, and give the spark plug something easy to light. So without that functional crossover with the stock carburetor, it'll never drive right. It'll always have that stumble, that hesitation when you give it gas. Okay. So, we says rather than screw around with this intake manifold and try to clean this one, which is a time-consuming, thankless, nasty job, we says, you know what, let's just scrap this manifold because this thing is a 1970s exhaust emissions type of manifold. It has an EGR valve. It has an electronic assisted choke, which is not compatible with the charging system that's on this car but it has this electronically assisted choke. It's just not worth getting involved with. Let's get the right intake manifold for a 1965 Barracuda and we'll go from there. So when we did that video, luckily enough, my buddy Zach Breitner sees the video and he messages me. He says, hey, I got the exact intake manifold you need for that car. I'll drop it off for you tomorrow morning. I'm like, awesome, let's do this thing. So the next morning I come in and this is sitting under the front of the car. So this is the correct 1966 through 69. 65 would have a, a different bolt hole, but the configuration of this manifold is the same. This is 66 through 69, 273, 318. And you see it has a conventional choke. And in fact, this choke, you see this thing has a, a direct line right to the heat crossover. It has this well and it has this conventional choke that fits on there. No EGR provisions, no extra bosses for sensors and stuff like that. Just the right style intake manifold for that year, that car, that engine. And then a funny coincidence. So Zach says, you know where I got that manifold from? I says, no. He says, I, I got that off that 273 I got from you years ago. I says, no fooling. So as it turns out, that intake manifold came off a 273 that came out of Slaghammer. Because before she was Slaghammer, she was a parts car. And I had this thing laying at the back of my lot. It was a 68 Valiant 273 four-door. And I had stripped everything off of this. The only thing left was the, the rockers, the roof, the quarters, and the, uh, and the doors. And then since then, it's been obviously completely refurbished or re reconfigured into Slaghammer. And it's a two-door now. But that was the original engine that came out of that car. So we've got like a bit of a reunion going on here, right? 
So he says, great, all I have to do is just clean that manifold up, paint it red, which is what the original color would have been in this, on this engine, and bolt it on. But before I do that, let me take care of some of the little annoying things that are bothering me with this. And one of them, one of the big ones, was an exhaust leak. Like one of my pet peeves, that exhaust leak off the cylinder head, where it's always going Nothing, nothing wrecks the experience of driving one of these cars and that exhaust leak. So this is where stuff starts to get interesting, okay? We noticed when we picked this up that it had these exhaust manifold gaskets and they were doubled up. There were two on each side. I didn't really think anything of it other than they have to go because these things will not last. I actually did a whole video on these. They come in all of these universal kits like these engine overhaul kits but they do not last and on these engines they don't belong at all. On these engines and a lot of other engines the exhaust manifold gets bolted directly to the cylinder head with no gasket. Sometimes they'll use like a steel shim gasket but it has to be something that will allow movement. Right? Like for instance the washers the washers that go to the bolts that hold the exhaust manifolds on, they're these conical style washers. And these are so that the exhaust manifold can expand and contract and move around independently of the cylinder head. So when you use these gaskets, that normal expansion and contraction and movement, it tears away at them. And it's just really a few heating and cooling cycles before they start to leak. So don't ever, ever use these things. I know, they're in all the kits. Don't use them. If you need header gaskets, use header gaskets. But don't use these. So, I says, let me get these things off and I'll probably fix the exhaust leak. So I do the passenger side and it's all good. I fire up the engine, no leak from the passenger side. I says, let's do the driver's side now. Now the driver's side on these things is a bit of an issue. And before I even get into any of that, I have to explain one of the quirks of idiosyncrasies of these early, these V8 early A bodies. So these cars were originally designed in 1960 around the Slant 6. Like the, the whole car, the engine compartment, is literally designed around the Slant 6. In 64, when Chrysler decided to put the V8 in these things, hmm, it wasn't really a happy fit. And out of all of the classic era Mopars, like all of them, right? These early A-bodies, these early V8 A-bodies are the most difficult to work with because of the packaging on the driver's side. So, you can, now this engine is already jacked up four inches. There's a jack still sitting underneath it. And to access any of this, you've got to unbolt the motor mount and jack the engine up. So you see here, you've got the starter and you've got the steering column and this intersection between the starter and the steering column. And then right underneath there, you've got the torsion bar. So to make the exhaust manifold fit on these cars, they came up with this crazy casting right here. So you see it comes up high over here and that's to clear the steering box. And then it comes down and it has this crazy long skinny curve and then a rear exit. And that's because there's no room for a down exit with the torsion bar location on these cars. 1967, they widened them two inches and it made the fit completely different. But on these early cars, this is how it had to be done. Starter is here, steering column is here, and the exhaust has to pass out the back. And it has this extra boss, and I'll get to that in a minute. So, Here's what happened, and this is what I mean about people putting cars together without really doping things out or without knowing the compatibility of the parts. So that's the original exhaust manifold that came with this car, but the engine is a 1970s 318. Now, here's the exhaust port and, and the, the, the mounting surface, and this is all exactly the same as the 273. But in the 70s, they added these air injection ports underneath each of the exhaust ports. And this was a common emissions device. So they pumped air into the exhaust through these ports to help burn some of the unburned fuel that was coming through. Very common. But this cylinder head is not compatible with that exhaust manifold. 
The manifold will bolt right to it, but it won't fit against the block. And here's what we found. So you see right here, we've got these witness marks and we've got this freshly, uh, let's say gouged witness mark. Well, that's because that boss interferes with this section of the exhaust manifold. And because of that, when they tightened it down, it broke off this ear. And this was our exhaust leak. Yes, we're gonna fix that. I'm, and I'll get into that in a second. So this is what happened. They put this together, they bolted it together. They found that it had an exhaust leak. So they put an exhaust manifold gasket on it. It still leaked. So they doubled it up and put two exhaust manifold gaskets on it. And it was relatively quiet. But at some point during this process, they cracked this ear off of it. And so this was our exhaust leak. The fix for this on the car is, or the fitment issue is really not a big deal. All we have to do is take a grinder to this section right here. Just dress that down so that the, that section of the manifold can fit against it. And that'll fix this problem. But still, we have to fix the exhaust manifold. These manifolds don't grow on trees. Um, it's a very unique casting. And like I said, it exit to the rear as opposed to the later ones, which exit down. These things go for between three and five hundred dollars when you find them in good shape. And you do find a lot of them that are cracked like this. So this is a common issue. So that's the deal with this. I'll cover, we're going to do the whole, a whole video on repairing this. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that it'll work. I'm not worried about that. I've repaired stuff like this before. Now one of the other things that was missing from this whole setup and is important is you see right here on this flange so here's where the pipe bolts up to it here's where the bolts that hold the flange together are and then you've got this extra boss right here and this boss is is supposed to attach with a couple of brackets to the back of the cylinder head right here so i said this is a packaging nightmare the way these the way everything fits together on these cars the kick down linkage the bracketry to hold the back of the exhaust manifold the manifold itself it's just all jammed in there it's not a happy situation but we do have to find those brackets and if i can't find them i'm gonna have to fabricate something because over time the manifold will crack it won't crack in the same place it won't break that ear it'll break further down i've seen that happen so we're gonna have to do something with that now also now you talk about not being not familiar with the car the way things are assembled from the factory or maybe not doping things out completely there's another issue that i came across so here's the battery cable that goes down to the starter and here's the wire that trips the solenoid well they had it routed right here coming up to the battery but the problem with that now is that this section of the cable is up against the bottom of the exhaust manifold. It's just a matter of time before this burns through and you've got a severe short. This cable has to be routed underneath. So you see right here is a wire holder and here is another wire holder. And the reason why they did this is to keep the, the cable off the manifold and also keep it from rubbing against the shaft as it's turning. So this has to get routed underneath. It's not as simple as it looks, or it's really not that big of a deal, but I've got to unbolt it from the starter and then feed it underneath because there are other wires that come off of this assembly here. But this is an example of not thinking things through and in, in the long run, you're gonna have an issue. Simple stuff. When you come across a car that you're not completely familiar with, don't just slam stuff together. Dope it out. Do dry assemblies. You know what I mean? Like, you, you don't have to put it all together permanently in one shot. If you're not familiar, put it together and look at all of the different relationships. Especially if you're mixing and matching parts. Like, this was a simple thing that could have been avoided with the exhaust manifold. It was a simple thing that could have been avoided by just taking a grinder to the bottom edge of that boss. And then that manifold would have sat directly flush to the cylinder head and it never would have a problem. Always go through these things. 
Take your time. Now there was one other thing I wanted to bring up to you guys. It needed a voltage regulator. So I went online, I went to Rock Auto, where I, I order all the simple parts you like Rock Auto. So I go voltage regulator 1965 Valiant. I see the picture of it. Yes, that's the one I need. I order it, it comes. But I didn't read the fine print because it's not actually the one I was looking for. So this is the voltage regulator and it works fine. It, it charges perfectly, no problems with that, but it's not what it appears to be. This looks like the original point style regulator. And in fact, it's even stamped ignition and field over here, but it's not a point style regulator. It's actually a transistorized or solid state voltage regulator. Now, like I said, it works. It works just fine. No issues with that at all, but it's not what I wanted. I wanted the original point cell regulator for a few reasons. When there is an issue with the charging system, the point cell regulator, you can get in there and fix it. You can clean the contacts and the points. You can change the gap on the points to alter the charging characteristic of the engine. When there's a problem inside of them, and generally it's these two small, these tiny wires that go up to the windings, when there's a problem with them, those wires will burn up. It's an easy fix on the side of the road. So basically the mechanical, the original point cell regulator that came with these is repairable. It's flexible, you can tune it, and it's repairable. And this thing is a throwaway. If there's any issue with it, any issue with the charging system, you're out on the road, it stops, you're done. So I'm gonna leave this in place. It works just fine, but I'm gonna order a correct point style regulator and throw that in a glove compartment. So when this thing does take a dump, and it will take a dump because I've had this happen before, when this one takes a dump, I'll just swap it out for the regular one. So that's where we stand with this. I get the intake manifold cleaned and painted and get that swapped on. I'll do a video on repairing this exhaust manifold in a couple of days, but for right now, I have to leave this thing alone and focus on these other two cars. So we ran mission and probable the other night and we ran our best time ever, but we did have some fuel starvation problems. And on the way home, they got really bad, like we barely drove the last few miles. So I gotta get the tank out of here and figure out what's going on with that. And Slaghammer is the next car out and we ordered a manual valve body kit from John Cope Racing and that should be here today or tomorrow. So we've got to swap the valve body on that. That's been a, a problem with this car since day one because when I put this transmission together, I didn't have a good valve body or a kit laying around. So I said, nah, I'll just throw a stock valve body in it. And because of that, it's had these lazy shifts, you know, first to second, second to third. So we're going to convert this to full manual valve body and we'll do a whole video on that also coming right up. So for right now, Scribbles has got to just Sit off to the side while we take care of this other stuff and we'll get back on it before too long. One step forward, sometimes several steps backwards, but it's that challenge. It's the challenge of beating all of these little things. That's, that's where the rewards are, you know? It's, the journey is its own reward. The finished product is nice. Don't get me wrong. Everybody wants to see the finished product. But it's like finding these little issues as you go along and fixing them there's all of these like little battles that you win you know little wars that you win and finally you conquer the battle and you drive it down the road with no problems it's all part of the game you know if it was easy everybody would do it i'll see you tomorrow